Right, in the last section, um, we learned about uh, sequences. So basically a list of numbers separated by commas and just trying to figure out um, whether or not a sequence converges, which boils down to evaluating a limit as n approaches infinity. Um, now, and for the rest of this chapter, our focus will be on series. So a series is what happens, is what we get if you take a sequence, and instead of separating those numbers by commas, you separate those numbers by addition signs. So it's like an infinite sum. That's what a series is. Now the terms of the series, that those are these individual elements, you know, numbers, values that we're adding up. So there are infinitely many terms in, um, in an infinite series. Um, we have these um, sort of limits of the series kind of like um, the index, right? So, so this series we say is in, indexed by n. Um, so that, those are the subscripts, right? So that, that's what determines, you know, we start at a1. I know I start at a1 and not a0 because um, that's what this says right here. So that's where we start. And I know it's an infinite series because uh, it goes up to infinity right there. There are finite series, and in that case, you know, it would be written as n equals 1 to, you know, some number like 10 or something, right? And that would just be the finite sum like that. But we're focusing on infinite series. Those are the most interesting ones. Um, now, one way to examine a series, I mean, and, and, and for the most part, you know, our focus, the question that we want to ask is, does this series converge? That's a really interesting and sometimes difficult question to answer. With um, a sequence, we just needed to evaluate a limit as an approach infinity of those terms of the sequence. Um, we'll find that with series, it's not quite so cut and dried. But one thing that we can do um, is look at the sequence of partial sums. So the partial sums of a um, of a series, so S1 is just the first term. S2 is you add the first two terms. S3 is given by the sum of the first three terms. Right, so if I just keep tacking on one more term and find that sum, then I get a sequence, what we call the sequence of partial sums. And the way we define convergence of a series is that if the sequence of partial sums converges, then the series also converges. Um, so, uh, for example, let's say I've got this series here defined by, you know, the terms of the series are 1 over 2 to the n, n starts at 1 and goes on to infinity. Um, we're going to figure out um, what the sequence of partial sums is. And we're going to do that just by kind of figuring out the first several partial sums and seeing if we can't recognize a pattern. So S1 is just A1. That's just the first term. So that's 1 over 2 to the first, or a half. S2 is, I'm going to take that first partial sum, 1 half, and I'm going to add the next term, 1 over 2 squared. So that's a half plus a quarter, or three quarters. S3, I'm going to take three quarters and add the next term. Add the third term, that's 1 over 2 cubed, or 1 eighth. And that is, um, uh, let's see, 7 eighths. S4, going to take the third partial sum and add the fourth term. The fourth term is 1 over 2 to the fourth, or 1 over 16, and that's 15 over 16. So, you know, we have the first several partial sums here. And now we want to see, can we figure out, is there a pattern here? Can I figure out, can I write an expression for what the nth partial sum is? Um, and if we look at the denominators here, 2, 4, 8, 16, those are all powers of 2. And the numerators look like they're all 1 less than the denominator. So that we could, we could summarize that here as 2 to the n minus 1 over 2 to the n. And if we evaluate this limit, 
we get 1. Now, the, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, you could use, you could evaluate this limit using L'Hopital, you know, if you want, right? The top and the bottom both go to infinity, so it does meet the criteria for L'Hopital. Um, but also, we could just sort of reason logically that this limit has to be 1. Um, the numerator is always just 1 less than the denominator. And as, um, as n gets huge, that subtracting 1 just becomes more and more insignificant, right? The difference that we get of subtracting 1 um, makes, you know, almost, almost no difference at all as you, as you go out to infinity. In fact, you could even see that algebraically. If you split up this fraction, uh, 2 to the n over 2 to the n is 1, minus 1 over 2 to the n, and then that is pretty clearly uh, equal to 1. So the limit of the partial sum sequence is equal to 1, and that means that this series from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n is equal to 1. So let's look at another one here. Um, we're going to find the nth partial sum of this series. So each term in this series is given by the difference 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. So I'm going to start out just by writing out the first several terms of the series. So if n is 1, we get 1 over 1, or 1 minus 1 over 2, 1 minus a half, plus, if n is 2, we get 1 half minus 1 third. If n is 3, we get 1 third minus 1 quarter, plus, if n is 4, we get 1 fourth minus 1 fifth, and so on, right? There's infinitely many terms, but now let's see what happens. Um, the parentheses that I've written here are really just to kind of help us um, see what each individual term is, but the parentheses are not required here, right? I mean, order of operations wise, um, I'm adding the stuff that follows in the parentheses, so we don't need to have those parentheses. Um, and with that being the case, it's not too hard to see that this minus one half and plus one half, those sum to zero. The minus one third and plus one third, those sum to zero. Likewise, those sum to zero, and that'll just keep happening forever, right? For every, uh, you know, set of successive terms um, that we keep tacking on. So we can use this to figure out what the nth partial sum is. So first of all, we can all see definitely that we do not, that this one in the beginning here, that doesn't cancel with anything. So I know I'm going to have that. And then um, and then what persists? Let's see, the first partial sum, I'd be subtracting a half. The second partial sum, those one-halves cancel, and I'd be subtracting one-third here. In the third partial sum, those one-thirds cancel, and I would just be subtracting one-quarter. So in the nth partial sum, all the terms will cancel except for that initial one, and the last thing that we're subtracting, which is 1 over n plus 1. Now the limit, as n approaches infinity, of 1 minus 1 over n plus 1 is equal to 1. So, so this series converges. This sum, infinite sum, is equal to, uh, is equal to 1. So this, this series that we just looked at um, had some really helpful behavior, right? All those inner terms kind of canceled, right? The minus one half and the plus one half, the minus one third and the plus one third. In fact, it's almost as if this infinite series just sort of collapsed on itself. And for that reason, this type of series is given the name um, a t of a telescoping series, right? Because the terms, those inner terms just collapse on themselves. Um, a telescoping series has this form. 
Um, and note here, in the way it's written, we have a minus b2 and then a plus b2. We have a minus b3 and a plus b3, and so on. Um, and the sum is given by, as we noticed here, uh, b1. This is this initial term. This doesn't cancel with anything. So that's why it's retained in the partial sum. Um, in, or in every partial sum, and so the limit of the partial sums. Um, and so the overall the sum is given by that initial term minus the limit as n approaches infinity of you know that bn term at the end. Um, all right, so now let's answer another question. This is not a telescoping series, so that so example 513 is not really related to this last problem. But let's just think about what the sum of this series is. This is the infinite series where every term is equal to 1. So if, um, you know, if we were to just write it out, if I just keep write, if I write out this infinite sum, the first term is 1, plus this next term is 1, the next term is 1, the next term is 1, right? Every term is 1. I'm adding 1 to itself infinitely many times. There is no limit to that, right? That'll just keep getting bigger and bigger. So the sum of this series is infinity. Um, and in fact, you could also observe, if you wanted, that the p nth partial sum of this series is just n, right? Because you'd be adding 1 to itself n times. Um, so this doesn't converge to any value. There's no actual value that that sum gets closer to. So we say that the series from n equals 1 to infinity, uh, where every term is 1, we say that that series diverges. Much like the same way that we use that language when we talk about a sequence that doesn't approach a limit, or when we talked about those improper integrals, if an improper integral did not approach a, a fixed value. Um, so this series diverges. The other thing I want to point out about this series is that um, is to encourage us to really not get caught in the trap of thinking of a series in the same way that we think of a sequence. You know, with a sequence, we're just looking for the terms to converge to something. But with a series, the terms can converge and your series can diverge. You know, in this case, the terms of this series, they're all one, right? Though that clearly converges. It's just a constant sequence, one. But the series with those terms blows up, right? This diverges to infinity. Um, let's go back to um, talking about telescoping series. And this series they give us it doesn't look telescoping right now, but it says um, writing a series in a telescoping form use partial fractions. So they've given us a bit of a hint here. Um, we're going to rewrite this series, and we're going to do it first by doing some algebra on the term, um, on this nth term, 2 over 4n squared minus 1. Now, 4n squared minus 1 is a difference of squares, so that's 2n plus 1, 2n minus 1. So I'm going to do a little side work here. So we have some unknown constant a over 2n minus 1 plus some constant b over 2n plus 1. Uh, multiplying through by this denominator, the LCD here gives us the equation 2 equals a times 2n plus 1 plus b times 2n minus 1. Now, um, it, for this one, there are convenient values of n that we could use. For example, if n is uh, 1 half, then that makes the b term cancel out. And so we get 2 equals, 2 times a half is 1, so 2 is equal to 2a. And that means that a is equal to 1. And if n is negative a half, that makes the a term cancel out. So we get the equation 2 equals, the a term cancels, that b term becomes uh, negative 2b. So b is equal to negative 1. <coughs> 
And that means that this fraction, 2 over 4n squared minus 1, is equal to 1 over 2n minus 1 uh, oops, minus 1 over 2n plus 1. Okay, so I'm going to use that to rewrite this series. So we're looking at the series from n equals 1 to infinity, whose terms are 1 over 2n minus 1 minus 1 over 2n plus 1. Now this is starting to look more like a telescoping series. Um, and to see that, um, let's write out the first few terms. So when n is 1, we get uh, two minus, we get one minus one third plus when n is two we get one third minus one fifth and when n is three we get one fifth minus one seventh so the denominators are just successive you know consecutive odds right and this goes on forever. So we could see this canceling happening, like we saw in the last example. Right, we know that'll happen with the 1 7 as well. And the nth partial sum, well, the first term, which is 1, does not cancel. And um, let's see, the term that remains is the second fraction that hasn't been able to cancel with the next one yet, right, because we've stopped at the nth term. So that'd be 1 over 2n plus 1. Um, the limit, as n approaches infinity of this partial sum, is 1, because this goes to 0. And so that means that this series converges, and it converges to 1. And, you know, when we say that it equals 1, that implies that we're saying that it converges, but um, it's good to just write that explicitly as well. This is what we mean when we say that a series converges, that that infinite sum tends to a specific finite value. Um, all right, so telescoping series are a special kind of series, and if we can recognize that we see it, you know, when we have a telescoping series, we can use what we know about those inner terms collapsing to determine if the series uh, converges. Um, uh, our next special kind of series is called a geometric series. Now, a geometric series looks like this. Now, notice with a geometric series, um, we start at zero. And it's not that a geometric series always has to start at zero. What is really important is that in theorem 16, that equation only holds when n starts at zero. And we'll talk more about theorem 16 in a minute. But here's what makes a series geometric, is that from one term to the next, you get that next term by multiplying by the same value, which we call the ratio. So... Right, we just so we have some initial value, initial term is of what which we're calling a here, and then um, we multiply by r to get the next term, a r. You multiply by r again to the next to get the next term. That's a r squared, and so on. Right, so we have this constant ratio between successive terms, and that's what makes a series geometric. Now. A nice thing about a geometric series is we know exactly when it converges and exactly when it diverges. So a geometric series converges, this is what theorem 16 says, the geometric series converges if the absolute value of r is less than 1, and it diverges if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1. That is always true, regardless of where your geometric series starts. So that test, what we call a convergence test, uh, holds, even if n doesn't start at 0. Now, 
if your geometric series converges and your geometric series starts at n equals 0, it will converge to this fraction, a over 1 minus r. If you're working with a geometric series that doesn't start at 0, don't sweat it. You can still use that formula and then just make some adjustments. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in a minute there. But first, let's look at example 515. Here they've given us a geometric series. This one does start at n equals 0. And the terms are 3 times 1 half to the n. So this is geometric. Um, the value of a is equal to 3, and the ratio r is equal to 1 half. And we'll note that um, the absolute value of a half is less than 1, and so that means it converges. Right now, we've applied what we would call that geometric series convergence test. I've observed that it's geometric. I noted that the value of r, its absolute value, is less than 1, and so it converges. Now, we can determine what it converges to. Um, and um, because it starts at n equals 0, I'm just going to use this formula up here. a over 1 minus r is 3 over 1 minus a half, which is 3 divided by a half, and that's 6. Now, as I mentioned before, even if your series doesn't start at n equals 0, you could still use that formula, and then I said, and make some adjustments. So let's say I want um, to find, and actually, I think what I'll do here is just, I'm going to add another page here. Um, so let's say I want to find the sum of the series where n starts at 1 and goes to infinity, and it'll be, the terms will be the same, so 3 times 1 half to the n. So we already know we already know it's geometric and it converges. So what you want to do is just observe that this series is sort of contained in the series that starts at 0. In fact, I could take this series from n equals 0 to infinity and break this up and say, okay, the n equals 0 term is 3 times 1 half to the 0 plus, and then I have the rest of the terms starting at 1. So I'm just going to write it out that way. So we can use theorem 16 to find this value, which we did in the last example. So we know that that's 6. Uh, 1 half to the 0 is 1, so this is 3 plus this series. And now we just subtract 3, and we find that this series, if n starts at 1, converges to 3. Um, the you know our takeaway should be that just if we have a geometric series, be really careful about where the series begins, what value of n it begins at, um, and make sure we take that into account if we're looking to find the sum of a convergent geometric series. All right, um, our next example we want to find the sum of this series. Well, this is uh, also geometric. I could tell when a series is geometric because its terms look like some constant multiplied by another constant raised to the n power. Now, in our case, that first constant, which we call a, is just 1. And it's this presence of some constant raised to the n power. right? That's really that's what signals to me that this is geometric. So it's geometric. a is equal to 1. r is equal to 3 halves. In this case, though, let's apply theorem 16. That convergence test says it converges if the absolute value of r is less than 1, diverges if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1. So in this case, 
that absolute value is greater than 1, and so that means that this sum diverges. Geometric series have um, have an interesting application, um, and we can use it to write um, a repeating decimal as a fraction. You might already be aware of the fact that um, a decimal that has a repeating pattern is a rational number. Um, irrational numbers will go on infinitely. Um, their decimal will go on infinitely with no pattern. If the decimal either uh, ends, like is terminal, or um, if it goes on forever with a repeating pattern, it's rational, meaning we can write it as a fraction. And that's um, one thing that we can use um, a geometric series for. So the first thing I'm going to do is just rewrite this decimal, and I'm going to look, rewrite it as a sum. I'm going to think of it as a sum 0.12 plus 0 0.0012. So that adds the next 1, 2 block. And now I'm going to add the third 1, 2 block here. So 0 0.000012 plus, and it goes on forever, right? Add another, you know, my next term would be two more zeros, and, and then my next block, one, two block. Um, now I'm going to just rewrite each of these. So this is 12 over 100. This is 12 over 10,000. This is 12 over 100,000, or sorry, no, a million. Going to keep going. I got these powers of 10 on the bottom, so I got 12 over 10 squared, 12 over 10 to the fourth, 12 over 10 to the sixth. And we just want to get to a point where we can recognize when, um, uh, you know, how to write this as a geometric series. So I'm going to scroll back to our definition of a geometric series. When the series starts at n equals 0, a is that first term. So if I want to write this series so that it starts at n equals 0, I'll just note that um, this first term, 12 over 10 squared, that's my value of a. And then the value of r, let's see, what do we multiply by to get between, you know, from one term to the next? That's a 1 over 10 squared. And that's to the n power. So that's our geometric series. a is equal to uh, tw 12 over 10 squared. r is equal to 1 over 10 squared, and, you know, the absolute value of r, that's certainly less than 1. So it does converge. And using that theorem, and since this does start at n equals 0, I neglected to write that out, but um, since it does start at n equals 0, I can just use that formula without needing to make any adjustments. So a over 1 minus r is going to look like 12 over 10 squared over 1 minus 1 over 10 squared. And I'm going to do a little arithmetic here. So uh, 12 over 10 squared times, and the reciprocal of this. So the denominator is, uh, let's see, 10 squared over 10 squared minus 1 over 10 squared is 99 over 10 squared. So I'm dividing by that, which means I'm going to multiply by 10 squared over 99. Of course, those 10 squareds will cancel. We get 12 over 99, or uh, 4 over 33. And that's the fraction that's equal to the repeating decimal. OK. Um, some properties of series. Suppose I have a couple of series and they converge, right? Maybe my ANs converge to A, my BNs converge to B, and C is just any real number. 
Um, the first property says that um, I can pull a constant multiple out of a series. Um, and that's basically like um, factoring a common factor from the infinitely many terms in the sum. Uh, the second one, actually, well, the second and third ones say that I can split up an infinite sum over addition and subtraction. All right, we're going to end with a couple of theorems. So theorem uh, 18 says that if the series converges, then the sequence of terms has to converge to zero. Um, that kind of makes sense. I mean, if the terms didn't converge to zero, you'd keep adding, um, you'd keep adding these values that are at least as big as some number, like that series that we looked at, where every term was one, right? I mean, those I just kept adding one to itself over and over again, and maybe it doesn't get big very quickly, but it still is going to grow without bound. There's no limit to how big you can make that sum. Now. If you take theorem 18 and form what we call the contrapositive, kind of turn it around and put it on its head a little bit, you get theorem 19, which is a te test for divergence. And I'm going to emphasize that um, and, just, and just say right now, this test, and I'm going to say this probably a million more times this chapter, this can only be used to show divergence. So, um, so this, the test goes like this. If your terms don't converge to zero, then the series has to diverge, right? So in order to have a chance of having your series converge, your terms have to go to zero, but be really careful. Just because your terms go to zero does not mean that your series will converge. So, um, for example, here, uh, uh, we're looking at the series whose terms are given by 2 to the n. Now, if I just take the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth term, 2 to the n, right? We call it the nth term test. Look at the limit as um, n goes to infinity of your terms. Now, this limit, as n gets huge, 2 to the n gets huge. This goes to infinity. And you know what? Infinity not equal to zero, and that means that the series diverges. Um, here we have another uh, another series here. Let's apply this. Um, often we use the nth term test initially. You know, we'll just say, hey, I'm going to see if my terms go to zero. If they don't go to zero, I know it can't converge, and I've got my answer. The series diverges. If they do go to zero, usually we have more work to do to see what's going on. Um, so let's look at the limit as n approaches infinity of n factorial over 2 times n factorial plus 1. Now, as n gets huge, both the top and the bottom go to infinity. This is not something we can apply L'Hopital to, though, because the factorial is not a continuous function. We can't take its derivative, but we can do some algebra. Let's multiply the top and the bottom by 1 over n factorial. Up top, n factorial times 1 over n factorial is 1. On the bottom, we're, you know, we're going to distribute this. So 2 times n factorial over n factorial is 2 plus uh, 1 over n factorial. 1 over n factorial, that goes to 0 because n factorial is, gets, grows without bound. And so this limit is equal to a half. So look, the terms here... The terms of this series approach one half, and you know what's true about one half? It's not equal to zero, and that means that the series diverges. Let's do one more here before we close out this section. Um, this series, the terms are given by 1 over n, that's the nth term. Uh, so let's evaluate the limit. Let's find the limit as n approaches infinity. We're trying to apply this nth term test, right? So we're going to set the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth term. 
this limit is zero. What does that mean for our series? It means nothing, all right? In this case, the test is inconclusive. Right? The nth term test can only be used to show divergence. If your terms do not approach zero, your series has to diverge. If your terms do approach zero, we don't know. It could converge, it might not. In fact, the most interesting work comes from working with series whose terms do approach zero and finding that a lot of them still blow up, right? Some of them will converge, some of them will diverge, and we're going to spend the next several sections of this chapter trying to figure out techniques to determine when a series converges and when a series diverges.